last lecture, we dealt with the German preparations for the invasion of Great Britain. Germany, Britain, everyone understood that an invasion was being planned, that the Germans were attempting to, would be attempting to launch a cross-channel invasion of the British Isles. The prerequisite, the point of departure for this, was air superiority over the channel, over the landing beaches in southern England. Anticipated then by everyone was an air battle. That battle would come in the summer and early fall of 1940. It came to be known as the Battle of Britain, and that is what we will take up in this, our eighth lecture. We'll examine the course of the air war over Britain from July to October of 1940, the period that is usually referred to officially as the Battle of Britain. Look at the objectives of the German air campaign, the Luftwaffe's plan to establish air superiority. We'll look at the British countermeasures, some of the British advantages, uh, technological advantages, planning advantages they had. And then we will conclude with uh, a description of life in Britain under the bombs, living through the Blitz. The Blitz is the period, not so much in reference to the Battle of Britain itself, but to this longer phase of bombing. Uh, that Britain was forced to endure uh, through the fall and winter of 1940 and into 1941 when the Germans shifted their bombing objectives from airfields to the civilian population and to uh, major urban centers. As the Germans and British both confronted the problems involved with a cross-channel invasion, the British held some significant advantages. We've talked about some of those in the, in the last lecture. I'd like to emphasize in this lecture the role of Fighter Command, the RAF. Fighter Command was led by Air Marshal Hugh Dowding, who had led this element of the Royal Air Force for some time. The Fighter Command possessed two excellent fighters, both of which Dowding uh, had helped to develop the Spitfire and the Hurricane, which flew at speeds in excess of 300 miles per hour. Uh, they were well armed. They were highly effective operational aircraft, certainly the match for anything the Germans had at their disposal. Aircraft production for fighters had jumped dramatically in the summer of 1940 under the leadership of Lord Beaverbrook, appointed by Churchill to a new post created during the war, the post of four air the Ministry for Aircraft Production. Beaverbrook assumed that position on May 14 and began an extraordinary campaign for aircraft construction. Indeed, throughout the crucial months of 1940, when aircraft would be at such a premium, the British would actually produce more fighters than would Germany. In fact, by a ratio of almost four to one in the course of this crucial battle of Britain. Throughout the battle, the RAF was able to put up approximately 600 fighters daily to the Germans 800. This part of the production issue here, and I, I will say this parenthetically, Hitler constantly, even during the Battle of Britain, certainly after the fall of France, desperately wanted to shift the German economy back to a complete peacetime footing. He was always talking about this. This was always on his mind. We will see this come into play later on in more extraordinary circumstances in October of 1941 when the, with the Germans deep inside the Soviet Union. He was eager to move back to a peacetime economic uh, schedule of production. As a consequence, the British, who were desperate in the summer of 1940, are producing like mad, factories going at 24 hours a day, something the Germans, incidentally, never got around to doing during the entire course of the Second World War, running factories on a 24-hour uh, uh, basis. So the British were, I think, driven, obviously, by desperation, driven by fear of this imminent German invasion, producing uh, at a quite extraordinary rate in the summer of 1940. Britain also possessed a technological asset of inestimable value, and that was radar. It had been developed in Great Britain by Robert Watson Watt, a team of and a team of government scientists. Its use for air defense was quickly perceived before the war, and by 1937, a series of some 50 radar installations the so-called home chain, covered the British East Coast and uh, to the north, providing early warning against approaching aircraft from the continent. Uh, 
Reports from these radar stations or from the Ground Observer Corps were flashed to Fighter Command headquarters outside London at Uxbridge. And the country was divided into four defense sectors, with its own each with its own fighter group. Using the early warning provided by radar, Fighter Command could vector squadrons to the anticipated target area to intercept the enemy planes or to reinforce the sector under attack. The way the system worked was radar was effective in picking up the approaching German formations. That information would then be flashed back to Uxbridge, but at the same time, uh, this extraordinary network of, of civilian observers was also employed. They would then follow the approach, the, uh, the, the communication between these ground observers and fighter command was also extremely important. The Germans never quite, I think, appreciated the role of radar uh, when it mattered during the Battle of Britain. We'll see this uh, in just a moment. Uh, and extraordinarily, never, I think with one exception, actually uh, launched a systematic attack on the radar installations. Also of some value to the British was ULTRA, the ability to read German coded communications uh, that we've talked about in the past. Reports from ULTRA indicated certainly that Germany was having some logistical problems. British High Command was informed about difficulties with the tugs, with the barges, the movement of troops to the coast. This sort of discussion we talked about in the last lecture about the problems of transporting troops across uh, the channel. Ultra was also important in that it was a, the British were able to determine the location of German airfields in France and in Holland, uh, and also had some sense of Luftwaffe strength. What Ultra could not do was to help really to be very useful in determining targets or operational objectives of the German Air Force. In other words, it didn't, the British weren't able to follow literally orders coming down from above uh, to, to projected targets for a particular day or, or night. Nonetheless, with radar and with ultra in place, these were advantages, assets that the British uh, had and were certainly very thankful for as they prepared for this Battle of Britain. The first phase of the long-anticipated German air offensive against England would come in July. German bombers began to appear over coastal England on July 10th, attacking several port cities, Plymouth, Dover, Portsmouth, and others. For almost three weeks, German planes attacked coastal defenses and shipping, sinking over 40,000 tons, but never really denting Royal Navy strength in the channel. Uh, the British, of course, tried to disperse the fleet to keep it at the periphery. It didn't want to be caught in the, in the channel uh, where it would be really vulnerable to German attack. Uh, but it was always lurking just off scene, as it were. Um, attacks on RAF airfields began on August 8th, but there was surprisingly little contact between the Luftwaffe and the RAF in this initial phase of the Battle of Britain. The great air battles uh, that one sees so much about were still uh, waiting to occur. Still, by the, by the beginning of August, even after these initial raids, which were nowhere nearly as intense as what was about to fall on Britain, the Germans had already lost over 100 bombers. With the invasion of Britain set for September 15th, the Germans launched Operation Eagle on August 13th with the objective of breaking English, the English Air Force in, as the order read, the shortest possible time. The targets were airfields, flying units, and supply, as well as the aircraft industry. It is, it, I indicated this a moment ago, but it's remarkable as the Germans, even after their first experience flying over these British radar installations, which were quite substantial edifices along the coast, as the Germans planned their attack on the Royal Air Force and all of the installations associated with it, they never actually targeted these, these radar stations. There was no plan to destroy them. So I think we see right away the, the, the underestimation, the lack of understanding of exactly how important these radar installations were at this point. The Germans inflicted terrific casualties on the British, shooting down over 100 British planes, but they also absorbed great casualties themselves. 
Moreover, British pilots were able to bail out, fly again, uh, whereas the, a German pilot lost, uh, shot down over Britain, was lost. And one sees already beginning in this phase of the Battle of Britain uh, that, I think, romantic stereotype that one has from the Battle of Britain of the RAF pilots sitting slumped in their, their leather chairs, uh, looking like sort of a Cambridge or Oxford, Oxford College, their silk scarves. Uh, they're alerted. They race out to their, to, their, to their hurricanes or to their spitfires with the grass airfields, zoom off to confront the wave of German bombers coming in, fight or shot down, bail out, or back in time for tea. Uh, another alert comes later in the afternoon. Uh, they're up in the plane and off again. This is a stereotype. It was the, bit, the, the sort of the stuff of Errol Flynn films in the, in the Second World War, the dashing RAF pilots during the Battle of Britain. It's one of those cases where the stereotype actually, I think, uh, is quite true. British pilots did. There were any, over and over again, one saw, in, if one reads through the RAF reports, from the Battle of Britain of British pilots who were shot down, bailed out, uh, came down, were transported back to their units in the afternoon, and then were up uh, in uh, operations again later on in the same day, or certainly the next day. Um, so Germ Germans uh, found themselves confronting English farmers' pitchforks uh, when they came down if they bailed out, uh, and so therefore were lost to the Luftwaffe. On August 24th, with losses mounting on both sides, the Luftwaffe shifted its objective to the airfields themselves, to concentrate on the airfields, the RAF airfields. It would be the crucial phase of the battle. During the last week of August, the RAF lost so many planes and pilots that replacements could not keep pace. Concentrated German attacks, for the first time, left fighter command in a desperate position and alarm swept the government. At this point, in the last part of August, there was, for the, for the first time, I think, in British ruling circles, government circles, a real fear, and certainly within the RAF, that if the, Germ the Germans had now found the key, if they continued, if these systematic attacks in the airfields continued, the RAF was not going to be able to rebound. Uh, no matter how much Elan Vital the, the RAF pilots possessed, no matter how many planes were being produced by Lord Beaverbrook, if the Germans continued this uh, pointed attack, the Battle of Britain would be lost. Fighter Command lost almost 300 aircraft between August 24th and September 6th, far more than German fighter losses in the same period. But on September 7th, the Luftwaffe miraculously from the British point of view, shifted its priorities once again, redirecting its attacks away from airfields to focus on the city of London. Mm. It was a drastic change in targets and its timing was absolutely critical. This shift in priorities, this is probably the, the, the critical element in the, in the Battle of Britain, was favored by Goering and approved by Hitler. It's often seen as uh, a reflection of the sort of Hitlerian uh, obsession for vengeance. The RAF had launched a surprise attack. And talk, it was a real surprise on the level, virtually, of, of Jimmy Doolittle's surprise attack on Tokyo in early 1942. The British, when they seemed to be down, out, the war lost, and so on, launched an air raid on Berlin. The Germans, uh, Goering at one point had said, if an, if a, if a, an allied bomb falls on, on a German city, you can call me Meyer. Uh, there were jokes already by the end of 1940 that uh, Field Marshal, uh, Air Marshal Meyer has made a mistake once again. Um, the first British raid on Berlin coincided with a visit to the German capital by the Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov. Uh, and as Molotov and Ribbentrop were discussing matters in the foreign ministry, air raid sirens began to peal the wail uh, over the city, 
and uh, Ribbentrop and Molotov and company had to adjourn to the bomb shelters down beneath the, the foreign ministry. It was a somewhat embarrassing moment for, for the Germans. Molot uh, according to Molotov's recollections of this, Ribbentrop had just been saying, well, the British are finished. Uh, we, need to, you know, we need to be making plans about uh, how the world is going to look after the fall of, of Great Britain. Uh, and having said, you know, Britain, Britain is, is finished, Molotov responded, well, if they're finished, what, who's that up there and why are we down, why are we down here in the, in the air raid shelter? It was not vengeance for this attack on Berlin. I'm sure that may have played a role. Uh, I'm sure it gave Hitler a great deal of, of satisfaction to be able to then bomb the capital of, of, of Britain, to move away from this strictly military uh, target to, to extract some vengeance for this raid on Berlin. But more important in German calculations than this was a belief that the attacks in the airfields had succeeded, were going well, but now what the Germans wanted to do was to lure the RAF up into the sky that an attack on London, that a series of attacks on London would bring, would concentrate British fighters in this one area, and that they could be shot down. This would work to be to Germany's double advantage. They would be able to bomb the capital city, cause damage, perhaps damage British morale seriously, and at the same time, uh, shoot down large numbers of RAF planes. That shift, however, was of decisive importance. London was heavily defended, and for 10 days in mid-September, bright, clear days, the skies over southeastern England were filled with formations of black German bombers droning toward London, where 2,000 anti-aircraft guns awaited them. Vectoring fighters to intercept, the RAF relentlessly attacked these formations of German fighters, and the losses were astronomically high for both. But by mid-September, the result was clear. The Germans had failed to attain their strategic objectives. The RAF had not been broken. British morale had not cracked and the Luftwaffe had been unable to secure the necessary air superiority for a cross-channel invasion. On September 17th, Hitler ordered the postponement of Operation Sea Line. It was a postponement technically, but everyone understood that this was it. This was, this was not going to be revived. Hitler was quite e actually quite eager to do it. One when, when senses almost relief on his part. This had never been part of the plan, this war with Britain. He still hoped that there might be some way out of it. He'd largely given up on Churchill. The idea that they could break British morale with bombing would still linger. It's one of the great un unlearned lessons, I think, of, of the Second World War and bombing in the Second World War is you don't break civilian morale uh, with bombing. The British morale was not broken during the Battle of Britain or during the Blitz, which followed, and nor would German or Japanese morale be uh, broken by Allied bombing during the war either. At the conclusion, then, in this period, uh, the Battle of Britain usually is, is seen as lasting from July 10th till the end of October, because the raids continued on into the end of October. German losses during this period were 1,882 aircraft. A disproportionate number of those were bombers. RAF losses were 1,265. So huge losses on both sides. Uh, during the war itself and even in Churchill's otherwise I think really remarkably good and useful history of the Second World War, there's enormously inflated numbers on both sides. The Germans claimed this, well, this is just sort of standard operating procedure for wartime claims. What is clear is that both sides had suffered terrifically. Up to this point, all of these air operations had taken place in the daytime. The availability of any sort of sophisticated aiming devices for aircraft, uh, well, there really was no availability. It was crude, bombing techniques were crude. Air crews had to be able to see what they were aiming at. There was no sort of radar bombing and this sort of thing at this point in the war, obviously. Um, and daylight operations were enormously costly. Both the British and the Germans would draw this conclusion, and it was that you could not conduct major air operations, certainly strategic operations, 
in date in the daylight. You were simply asking for trouble. It was at this point, at the conclusion of the Battle of Britain, when it was obvious that the RAF had done its job. September had come and gone. The German invasion had not come. Operation Sea Lion was clearly on hold or ultimately uh, abandoned. The British had made it. They had survived through this summer of 1940, and as fall approached and the bad weather over the channel approached, the British had what they needed, which was breathing space. They had indeed survived, and they had survived alone. It was at this juncture that Churchill would say, uh, utter those famous lines, and I think it's in this period when Churchill delivers virtually all of these great speeches that he is so well known for during the Second World War. Uh, the Wolf Fight on the Beaches, Fight on the Streets speech, uh, the, their, their Finest Hour speech, but also the line, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few his reference to the RAF pilots who had done such a remarkable job in defending Britain during uh, the German onslaught. I have to say at this point that this was this, this comment, the never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few, was paraphrased a bit later on in North Africa when hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of Italian troops surrendered to a very small British garrison uh, in the East, uh, I believe it was Anthony Eden who said, never in the field of human endeavor have so, have so many surrendered so much to so few. Um, <laughs> the Battle of Britain was over, but the German attacks continued. There was no longer a danger of a German invasion, but this didn't mean that Britain was, was out of trouble. In September, the Germans shifted to nighttime raids. Nighttime meant uh, this was a reflection of their own mounting losses, and they're concerned about those losses. And it also indicated that they had largely given up on any sort of precision bombing. This was not after, they were not after airfields bombing in the dark. They now shifted not only to nighttime, but also to attack London and other major urban centers in Britain. Indeed, the raids now became largely terror raids either to break British morale or simply to continue pressure on, on Britain. In November, Germany expanded the raids to other cities. The Coventry raid, uh, which destroyed, it was an industrial town, but destroyed the old 14th century Gothic cathedral in Coventry, uh, which was, I think for British morale, the sense of, the, the, you know, the Germans are barbarians. How can they be bombing? Uh, how can they be bombing these great cultural treasures and so on? Life in London during this period, this was, this was the period after the Battle of Britain when the nighttime raids began that is usually referred to as the Blitz. I'd like to read you a, a lengthy report uh, of life as Londoners began to live it in the fall of 1940. It would be a life that would continue on uh, with different levels of intensity off and on for the remainder of the war as the raids would, would continue, but certainly nothing like the intensity of these nighttime terror raids in the fall of 1940. As Londoners uh, were sent to bomb shelters, basements, the tubes, the, the undergrounds, the subways of London to escape the bombardment. This is from a a public record of a report on the activities in the Smithy Street uh, shelter uh, in East London in uh, September of 1940. This record begins at 8.15 p.m. September 7th inside a street shelter at Smithy Street, Stepney, East London. Already about 35 people have crowded in. Some are sitting on stools or deck chairs, some standing. At 8.15, a colossal crash, as if the whole street was collapsing, the shelter itself shaking. Immediately, an ARP, air raid patrol helper, a nurse, began singing lustily in an attempt to drown out the noise. Roll out the barrel. While Mrs. Smith, wife of di a dyer and cl cleaner, screams, my house, it's come on my house, my house is blown to bits. Her daughter, 25, begins to cry. Is it true, is it true, is our house really down? There are three more tremendous crashes. Women scream and there is a drawing together physically. Two sisters clasp one another. Women huddle together. 
there is a feeling of, of breath being held, everyone waiting for more, no more. People stir, shift their positions, make themselves more comfortable. Then suddenly a woman of 25 shouts at a younger girl, stop leaning against that wall, you bloody fool, like a bleeding lot of children. Get off it, you bastard, do you hear? Come off it, my God, we're all going mad. People begin shouting at one another. Sophie, 30, screams at her mother, you get on my nerves, you do. You get on my nerves. Shut up, shut up, you get on my nerves. Here the ARP helper, the air raid patrol helper, tries once again to start some singing. Roll out the barrel, she begins. Shut up your bleeding row, shouts a man of 50. We've, that's enough noise out of you. Outside, the gunfire bursts forth again. It grows louder, and now the ARP girl begins walking up and down the shelter between the rows of people, singing and waggling her shoulders. A fine-looking girl, tall and handsome, with a lovely husky voice. There's a good time a-coming, though it's ever so far away. An older woman to a young girl sitting beside her says, Why don't you sing? I can't. I don't want to. I can't, cries the girl. I can't. Oh, God. The singer tries to get people to join in, but they won't. She gives up and sits down. Around midnight, a few people in this shelter are asleep, but every time a bomb goes off, it wakes them up. Several women are crying. At each explosion, there is a burst of singing from the next shelter. Two men are arguing about the whereabouts of the last bomb. Suddenly, a girl cries out, I wish they'd bloody well stop talking and let me sleep. They talk such a lot of rot. It's such rot. That man, just listen to him. He's got such a horrible voice. Tell him to stop. Tell him I said he's got to stop. He's got a horrible voice. The girl's neighbor tries to calm her, urges her to try to sleep. No, she screams. It's no good. I'm ill. I think I'm going to die. By now, the women with the deck chairs are lying back in them, wearily rocking and groaning. A woman of 60 says, if we ever live through this night, we have the good God to thank for that. A friend says to her, I don't know if there is a God or he shouldn't let us suffer like this. When the all clear goes at about 4.30 a.m., there's a groan of relief. But soon, as the first people go outside the shelter, there are screams of horror at the sight of the damage. Smashed windows and roofs everywhere. Smoke streaming across the sky from the direction of the docks. People push and scramble out of the shelter doorway, and there's a wild clamor of shouting, weeping, and calling for absent relatives. Where, where'd she go? Oh, we never should have, shrieks a woman, incoherent with anxiety. Others sob and cry and cling to one another. One man throws a fit. Another is sick. Later that day, in the windowless front room of one of the shattered Smithy Street houses, a young woman sits among the remains of her possessions, crying her heart out. It's her birthday. I'm 26, she sobbed. I'm more than halfway to 30, and I wish I was dead. London would endure these attacks for 57 consecutive nights, running from the beginning of September on deeper into the fall. Nor did they stop then. After a lull in the winter, they were resumed in March and April of 1941 as the Germans again began a, a series of terror attacks on the center of London and other cities. It was to become a regular feature of British life. And it was a preview, a dreadful preview of what the air war would bring, not simply to England, but with far greater impact to the cities of Germany and later on to Japan as well. In late April of 1941 and into early May, the attacks on Britain, the air attacks on Britain began to subside. And then at the end of May, they stopped altogether. The planes, the German planes that had been such a, and made such regular appearances in the skies over Britain were simply no longer there. Where were they? Well, they had begun to move across the continent and were massing in what had previously been Poland. Hitler had given up on any sort of sustained attack on Great Britain and was preparing now for what was to be the main event. The largest military operation in human history was being planned by the Germans. It was not Operation Sea Lion, but Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. And this is where the aircraft had gone. At the end of this period then, of the Battle of Britain, and then the blitz through the fall and winter of 1940 and into 1941, Britain had stood alone, and Britain had survived. It was a major turning point in the Second World War.